this is everything in thermal physics and this is using the OCR A level in physics to structure it but really thermal physics is the same regardless of which exam board you study. I think it's quite useful to summarize big ideas in algebra for, to help us with our memory. So this little bit of algebra states that U which is the internal energy of a body is equal to the sum of the randomly distributed potential and kinetic energies of the molecules. So the symbol sigma just implies sum there. There are two ways that we can change the internal energy delta U and that is by doing work or by doing heating and a big idea in thermal physics is obviously the idea of heating. Heating is just heat moving from a hotter object to a colder object, an object with a higher temperature to a lower temperature. This sets up the value of that heating when an object changes its temperature the energy it gains or it loses is equal to the mass times the specific heat capacity times the change in temperature and this sets up the energy involved in a change of state. So this is energy is equal to mass times specific latent heat. And lastly, this expression here applies to ideal gases. And it simply really states that absolute temperature T is proportional to the average kinetic energy of the molecules. Now, these are some of the big ideas, but we can boil them down to really simple algebra. And I suggest that's something that you do as you work through any part of A-level physics. You try and memorize things in the simplest possible terms, but so that you can take as many big ideas from that really simple bit of algebra that you memorize. There are times when it's really appropriate to know a wordy explanation and time when it's appropriate to use some algebra. Temperature is a big idea and people have a poor definition of the difference between temperature and energy. Let's start by setting up an idea of thermal equilibrium and that is that objects at the same temperature have no net transfer of energy. So if two objects are at the same temperature then there's no transfer of energy between them. That is defined in the zeroth law of thermodynamics. And that states that if two objects are in thermal equilibrium with a third object, then the first two objects must be in thermal equilibrium with themselves. Now that seems like something quite obvious to say, but it actually sets up the idea of absolute temperature. That temperature doesn't depend upon what an object is. It doesn't depend upon what an object is made of. Temperature is proportional only to the average kinetic energy of the molecules. Absolute temperature does not depend on what substance it is, therefore. So if any object is at the same temperature as any other object, then they are in thermal equilibrium. There'll be no transfer of heating between them. So for example, if I took water or copper molecules at the same temperature, then each would have the same average kinetic energies in their molecules. One of the substances might have a higher internal energy because it might have a higher potential energy due to its state, or the particles of one might be vibrating with a higher speed because the other one might have a higher mass of particles, but the average kinetic energy of the particles would be the same at that same temperature. That's a really key idea in physics. So you always need to convert to Kelvin if you are seeing the capital T, absolute temperature. Now one degree Kelvin is equal to one degree Celsius. You just need to take the value in Celsius and add 273. Kelvin is a scale from absolute zero and absolute zero is minus 273 degrees Celsius. You only need to quote the zeroth law of thermodynamics, that's thermodynamics zero, but the others are good ideas to have, so I'm going to go through them quickly now. Now thermodynamics one is the idea that all things tend towards thermal equilibrium, so heat dissipates in a closed system. And that also encapsulates the law of conservation of energy, that idea that energy can't be created or destroyed, just transferred from store to store, which is a really big idea in physics, it's maybe the biggest idea in physics in fact. Thermodynamics two defines what heat is, and heat moves from from hot to cold. Heat moves from a higher temperature to a lower temperature. And actually it states that the rate of heating is proportional to the temperature difference. So the bigger the temperature difference, the bigger the rate of heat transfer between the objects. So thermodynamics 3 just defines absolute zero and it states that that would be the same for all substances. Uh, if, if there could be a point at which the molecules could have zero kinetic energy, then that value would be minus 273.15 degrees Celsius or zero degrees Kelvin. That is the coldest theoretically anything could possibly be. I always think it's worth noting there's a theoretical minimum, an absolute zero, but there's no absolute maximum. There's no hottest something could be. Hopefully you can see then that all of those laws are really encapsulated within the zeroth law of thermodynamics. <laughs>
When we describe solids, liquids and gases, we use something called the kinetic model. That is, the substances are made of particles and they have varying kinetic energies and electrostatic forces of attraction. We also need to define something called the internal energy, and that's the sum of the randomly distributed potential and kinetic energies of the molecules within a substance. Now, potential energy is due to the position between objects, always. Further spaced is always more potential energy. If two things are further apart, then they have a greater potential energy. Kinetic energy is due to a thing's speed and its mass. So these are the big ideas in kinetic theory. The potential energy of the molecules, how far apart they are and how attracted they are to each other in order to bring them back together, the forces trying to bring them together. And kinetic energy is due to how fast they're moving. Again, that's going to be related to the forces as well and their speed of motion. That idea of potentials, that idea of potential energy, the idea that something is further away has a greater potential energy, is a really key idea when understanding potentials. That helps us understand the ideas in quantum when we're talking about the energy levels in an atom. It helps us understand the ideas of gravitational potential energy and all different ideas that we'll come on to later in A-level physics. You'll be probably quite familiar with this graph from GCSE, the idea that during a change of state, the temperature doesn't change. As we heat up a solid, its temperature increases until it reaches its melting point. It starts to melt and it stays at one temperature for that period of time. Then you heat it, its temperature can increase again as a liquid, and then it stays at the same temperature as it boils. And then as a gas, you can begin to increase its temperature again. Look closely at what's on the axes here. You often see that as being time, but I've just said that's energy. As we increase the energy, we get a linear increase in temperature until we start to change state. Now what's actually going on there is during an increase in temperature, the kinetic energy of the molecules are increasing. During a change of phase, then their potential energies are changing. During melting, they're getting further apart, they're getting to a higher potential energy. And during freezing, then they're getting closer together and they're getting a lower potential energy. So here we have increasing kinetic energy, then increasing potential as it changes state, increasing kinetic energy as it heats, as it increases in temperature, and then increasing potential energy as it changes state, and then lastly again increasing kinetic kinetic energy as it changes temperature. The important thing about that graph is that temperature doesn't change during a change of phase. There's a pro tip here, which is just like energy levels in an atom, we measure the highest energy as being zero. So molecules and gases are said to have zero joules of potential energy and molecules in liquids and then solids, we talk about them as having negative potential energies. You can think about that as just being the energy that you need to give it, the potential energy you would need to gain to get to the gas phase. So although you can't have negative energies, you can have a negative energy difference. Kinetic theory all began when Brown noticed the random motion of particles. And we call this Brownian motion. And we now know, he didn't know at the time, we now know that's a result of collisions with the molecules of a surrounding medium. So we can actually observe that in a lab under a microscope by using a smoke cell. So you take some smoke and you trap it in a little piece of glass and you put a light on it and you can actually see the smoke particles dancing like that. They have this kind of random zigzagging motion. Einstein analyzed that in 1905 in his Annus Mirabilis and he used it to provide a mathematical proof of the existence of atoms. And that's evidence then for the kinetic model of matter. So in maths they have proofs and uh, in science we have evidence. So you think about these smoke particles being rather large compared to the particles we can't see under the microscope, the particles of the air. And the reason why they have this zigzagging motion is because they're constantly being bombarded by the air particles around them. Einstein was able to do the maths to show that the way in which they moved could be due to the other atoms, the other molecules that were present in that smoke cell. You'll no doubt be familiar with the particle pictures of solids, liquids and gases. And uh, you need to have really detailed and accurate descriptions of these things for your A-level physics. Be really, really careful because you've studied these from key stage three. And if you use the wrong terms, you'll lose easy marks here. Solids have particles which are held with strong forces of attraction in a regular three-dimensional lattice. They vibrate on the spot. They're fixed in their position. Liquids have particles which are free to move around each other. So they have a higher potential energy. So they're slightly further apart. They're slightly less fixed in their position. And because they can move past each other, that allows fluid behavior. Gases have particles with negligible forces of attraction, and they're moving at high speeds in random directions. And that idea of negligible forces of attraction will come back to us, that's why we define that as being the zero energy point. Different materials have different thermal properties, and one of those properties is specific heat capacity. That's the energy required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Now actually that's encapsulated in this equation here. The change in thermal energy is equal to mass times specific heat capacity times temperature change. 
In this case, it doesn't matter whether you use degrees or kelvins because we're just interested in a difference in, in two points, a difference in temperature. There are two methods that you need to know to measure the specific heat capacity of a substance. The first is an electrical heater method. You basically are going to plot a graph of energy on the y-axis and mass times temperature change on the x-axis. So you get specific heat capacity as the gradient of the graph. Now that uses the idea that the electrical energy is supplied, which is VIT, potential difference times current times time, power times time, is equal to the change in thermal energy. There's another method, which is called the method of mixture. Essentially what you do with this is you raise a mass of metal, a metal block to 100 degrees Celsius by leaving it submerged in some boiling water. So it's gonna reach thermal equilibrium with the boiling water. Then you submerge that block in some cool water and you have measured the mass and the starting temperature of that water and you measure the temperature change of the water. You measure the final temperature and you work out the temperature change. And you also therefore measure the temperature decrease of the metal. You then use the equation below to calculate the specific heat capacity of the metal. So the energy change for the metal once it's submerged in the water is this left hand side and the energy change for the water once the metal is submerged and they've reached thermal equilibrium again is on the right hand side and you use the value of specific heat capacity of water, which is known as 4,200 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. Now, it's a really difficult one to eliminate systematic error in either of these two practicals, and that's because there's always going to be thermal energy transferred between the block and their surroundings. In this case, they're normally hotter than the surroundings, so you're actually losing energy, you're actually heating the surroundings as well as heating the block. And for this reason, you normally get with these two experiments a slightly higher specific heat capacity than you're expecting. Another thermal property of materials is specific latent heat. There's two specific latent heats. One is for fusion, and that is energy required per kilogram for a change of phase between a solid and a liquid, and specific latent heat of vaporization, which is the energy required per kilogram for a change of phase between a liquid and a gas. Now, it doesn't matter whether we're going between a gas and a liquid or a liquid and a gas. It doesn't matter which direction it is, the energy change is the same. It's just whether energy is going in or energy is coming out. So for example, in fusion, when a substance melts, its internal energy is increased by the same value as it will decrease when it freezes. The equation for energy for a change in phase is E equals ML, so mass times specific latent heat. Now my pro tip here for this and the previous equation is that actually the units of specific latent heat and the units of specific heat capacity can tell you exactly what they mean. And that's a really important idea in physics, the idea that the units tell us the dimensions that tell us really what the definition of that quantity is. You need to know a method for measuring latent heat of a material and that's an electrical heater method. You need to know a method to measure the latent heat of fusion and of vaporization of water or any other material really. You can use an electrical heater to melt some crushed ice. You're gonna measure the potential difference, the current and the time, and the mass of water collected under a funnel. And if you plot a graph of energy on the y-axis versus mass of crushed ice on the x-axis, you get a gradient, which is the specific latent heat. This is the idea that the electrical energy, VIT, is equal to mass times specific latent heat. To measure the specific latent heat of vaporization, then you need to actually boil some water and collect the vapor that's made. So you actually need to recondense that vapor and then collect that and measure the mass of the recondensed vapor. So you're measuring the mass of water but that's the water that's been boiled, if that makes sense. As with the last experiment, you need to consider the energy transfer between the room and the substance you're investigating. And this again is going to lead to a systematic error in your result. Now, this is likely gonna be a little bit too small in the method for fusion, as the ice is gonna gain energy from the room. The room's gonna transfer energy to the ice. And it's gonna be a bit too large in the method for vaporization, as the hot water will transfer energy to the room. And another pro tip with these experiments is that temperature doesn't change during a change of phase. So we need to make sure our ice is already melting before we're beginning to measure the energy. If you pull ice straight out of the freezer, it'll likely be somewhere like minus 20 degrees Celsius. And you actually want to know that it's at zero when you start the experiment. So you crush it and let it begin to melt, dripping off any excess water before you start the practical. In the same reason, we wouldn't start measuring the energy when we were boiling the water before we reached boiling point, because we're only interested in the energy supply during the change of phase, not during the heating, not during the gain of temperature. An ideal gas is a way that we have of modeling the behavior of gases, and it comes down to three gas laws, the first of which you will probably be familiar with from GCSE, which is Boyle's law. For a fixed mass of gas at a constant temperature, 
pressure is inversely proportional to volume. Now there are two ways to write that. Pressure is inversely proportional to volume or pressure times volume is equal to a constant. They are the same thing. If you were to do this experiment, then you get a graph that looks something like this. If you double pressure, you half the volume. Then there's Charles' law, and that is for a fixed mass of gas at a constant pressure, the volume is proportional to temperature. So volume is proportional to temperature, or volume over temperature is equal to a constant. Then there's the Gay-Lussac law, or sometimes referred to as the pressure law. For a fixed mass of gas at a constant volume, the pressure is proportional to the temperature. So that can be written as pressure is proportional to temperature, or pressure over temperature is equal to a constant. These two give us graphs that look something like this. And I'll talk about that in a moment with how that is used to measure absolute zero. So these are straight lines through the origin. For me, it's worth learning both of these ways of expressing proportionality. One might be more useful for one situation and another might be more useful for another situation. They'd both be useful for different times when they'd expect you to maybe use proportional reasoning, either in a written question or even in a calculation question, where they tell you a change in one thing and expect you to work out the change in another thing. You can combine these three gas laws to give you the ideal gas equation, and that is PV equals NKT. Pressure times volume is the number of molecules of a gas multiplied by the Boltzmann constant multiplied by the absolute temperature. There's two ways to write this equation though, there's that first one, and there's also this one, PV equals NRT. Now little n is the number of moles, and R is the molecular gas constant. You will be expected to use both or either of these ideal gas equations. They are the same thing though, NK is equal to NR. If you haven't done that, it's well worth taking these three equations and actually combining them to give you the relationship between pressure, volume and temperature in an ideal gas. The number of molecules, that's capital N, is related to the number of moles by the equation N equals NNA. <laughs> so the number of molecules is equal to the number of moles multiplied by Avogadro's number. And this means, therefore, that the molecular gas constant and the Boltzmann constant are also related by R equals KNA. Avogadro's number is the number of molecules in any one mole of a substance, and that is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23 per mole. So that is how many molecules are in one mole of any substance. Some A-levels only require you to use one or the other, but in OCR they require you to use both. The ideal gas is a model. It's a way of explaining evidence. The evidence are the free gas laws and we combine them into this model of ideal gas. This slide is going to give us the detail on how that model works. It starts with the idea, the Newtonian idea, that gases exert pressure on the surfaces of their containers. And that is the same equation as static pressure, so that's pressure is force over area. The kinetic model of gases, the ideal gas model, assumes that we have a large number of molecules in random and rapid motion. So if you think about the Avogadro constant, we do indeed have a very large number of molecules, and we sometimes refer to this as statistical physics. It also assumes the molecules apply negligible volumes compared with the volume of the gases, so they can be thought of as points. It also assumes that the collisions are perfectly elastic, which is that there's no transfer of kinetic energy to anything else during the collisions. It also assumes that the time in which the collisions happen is negligible compared to the time between the collisions. So the time of the collision is very, very short, essentially. Too short to worry about. It also assumes that the intermolecular forces are negligible, so that the gas molecules are so far apart that it's not worth considering the forces between them. Except, of course, during the collisions between the particles and between the particles and the walls. So it's because those forces are negligible that we can say that the particles have zero potential energy in this model. And that effectively means that the internal energy is just the sum of the kinetic energies of the particles in the model. Pressure and volume are related to the average kinetic energy by this equation. Hopefully you can see the mc squared is a sort of expression which is related to the kinetic energy. Now you don't need to actually derive this from the assumptions in the model in the OCR A level. It is a really good exercise though for you to understand how that model arrives at this equation. So I do have a full video where I go through the derivation of that equation. It's a good way to understand the importance of those assumptions that the model makes. So this states that pressure times volume is equal to a third multiplied by the number of particles times the mass of each particle times the RMS speed squared. Now we'll talk about RMS speed in just a moment, the root mean square speed. But you can combine this first equation with the ideal gas equation to give this. A half mc squared, so that is the average kinetic energy of the molecules, is equal to 3 over 2 kt, and that's the Boltzmann constant times absolute temperature again. 
and you do need to be able to derive that from the previous two equations. So you need to be able to take these two equations from the ideal gas molecule and derive this third. You should probably see that's a case of making them equal to each other and doing a little bit of rearranging. We can say that the kinetic energies or the speeds of these particles in any ideal gas are distributed in what we call a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And that looks something like this. There are a few key characteristics that you need to be familiar with of this type of distribution. Let's just make sure we understand the graph first. It's a frequency graph. It tells you how many molecules are at each speed. So these are the higher speed molecules. You see there are fewer of those than this kind of average speed of the molecules. And the dotted line shows a higher temperature, which is lower peak and shifted towards the right of the graph. So the key features are there are zero particles with zero kinetic energy, and that means the lines intercept the origin. There are no particles with no kinetic energy. That has to be the case. And it also shows there's no maximum kinetic energy possible. So if you think back to absolute temperature, there's, there's an absolute zero, but there's no theoretical maximum. So we don't tie the line to the x-axis in the higher speed range. So the line does not touch the x-axis to the rightmost end of the distribution. Now the higher temperature, the flatter that curve goes and the further to the right it goes. So there's the same overall number of particles in these two distributions. It's just that more of the particles are higher kinetic energy or higher speed for the higher temperature. Now I've talked about averages so far, but there are three different averages that we're using here. The mode is the most frequent, so that is the peak. So the modal speed is the peak of the graph, wherever the speed is at the peak of the graph. The mean speed in Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is going to be slightly higher than that because we have that idea that there's zero at zero, but there could be some at very, very high kinetic energies. There's no theoretical maximum, so the mean is going to be slightly above that. And then lastly, the RMS speed, which we give the symbol C, is the root mean square speed. And that's an idea that we use when we're modeling ideal gases is when we want to ignore the vector nature of that motion. So because one speed could be a positive and one speed could be a negative, if we square them all, then we get rid of those negatives. But we have to then root again to get back to what we call the root mean square speed, the RMS speed. But that effect of squaring and then rooting actually leaves us with a slightly higher RMS speed than a mean speed. It's not a massive distinction to make, but it's an important one. The RMS of something is not exactly the same thing as the mean. You need to know how we can investigate the ideal gases and how we get to this evidence for this model. And you can investigate all three gas laws, but in this specification, they only expect you to know how to investigate Boyle's law and the Gay-Lussac law. So Boyle's law can be investigated using a pump and a pressure gauge, and you vary the pressure and you measure the volume of a trapped mass of gas. It's usually done with a fixed piece of apparatus that, it, that is just set up in your labs at school. It can also be done by loading a fixed syringe with some slotted masses. So we increase the pressure by adding slotted masses and we use force over area of the syringe to give us a pressure. You plot a graph of pressure on the y-axis versus one over volume. So that's the same graph as we had with the inverse proportional on the previous slide, but we've actually manipulated the algebra to give us a straight line through the origin. That shows that pressure is inversely proportional to volume. The Gay-Lussac law can be investigated using a submerged spherical flask. So we have a fixed mass of gas in a flask and that is submerged in a water bath and that's linked up to a pressure gauge. We vary the temperature and we measure the pressure for that trapped mass of gas. And then again we can plot pressure versus temperature and that should give us a straight line. We extrapolate that back, that's what is going on with the dotted line there, until it cuts the x-axis. And that is our experimental estimation of what absolute zero is going to be. That is going to give us a really large uncertainty because in the school lab at least we can only really measure temperatures of any gas between sort of zero and 100 degrees celsius because we're using a water bath to do it so there's not a lot of data between our actual line and our extrapolated intercept with the x-axis so you do tend to get quite large differences from absolute zero but actually repeated measurements of this can actually get you reasonably close to absolute zero even in the school lab my pro tip for any PAGs or any practical which is mentioned specifically in the specification is to make sure you consider all the evaluative points. So for example, in the typical Boyle's law apparatus, the pressure gauge is actually analog. So that's an example of when you have to actually interpolate between scale markings. And this can be less precise, but it doesn't have as much random error as maybe a fluctuating digital pressure gauge would have.
And again, for example, in the Boyle's Law apparatus, when you are pumping the gas, you're actually doing work on it. And so that is going to raise its internal energy. It could actually increase the temperature of the gas. And that could mean that one of your control variables had also changed. And that would make your conclusion less valid. We also in the apparatus use a analog scale of the volume and that can lead to a parallax error when you're actually measuring that volume. So you get down to eye level and you make sure that your volume is as close to the scale as possible to limit the parallax error.